this is the first of a, of a two weeks where we're going to get a better understanding of program evaluation. I think uh, that's is a really important topic. It's something we all are, are required to do as part of our jobs for the most part, and, and we're going to dive into it pretty deep today. But first, let's start by introducing ourselves. I'm Abby Wick, NDSU Extension Soil Health Specialist, and joined by... Hello, I'm Kevin Sedovic. I'm the NDSU Extension Rangeland Management Specialist and Director for Central Grasslands Research and Extension Center. And coming to us via Zoom as our special guest today is Jean Haley, who we call our Guru of Evaluations. And I want to introduce Jean so you can introduce herself. I'm uh, Jean Haley, and I do program evaluation. I've been doing it in agriculture since the mid-90s, and I've been doing it on my own since about 2001. And uh, Abby and I have been working on soil health uh, evaluations, gosh, for the past five, five or six years now, I think. So, yep, evaluations by life. Let's get right into this. We have a lot of cover to cover. So um, over the next hour, we'll be giving you all permission to talk about you. And Jean, maybe you can explain what we mean by that. So what Abby's talking about, this is one of my favorite slides ever for evaluation, because really, you're the center of your universe. So please make it useful for you. Um, I think that 99% of the time, folks in extension, um, unless evaluation is your job, the, you are being forced to do this. Um, so it ends up in that circle of stuff I hate, right? I hate to do this. I'm not excited about it. Somebody's making me do it. It's taking away from my programming time. And I just want to spend time on my programming. Well, if somebody's making you do it, if we can shove that in one more circle to be stuff about me, it gets closer to you being the center of your universe. And you'll actually start to hate it a little bit less at least. And maybe someday you'll even like it. Um, but making it useful for you can really um, change everything. That can change the game. Nice. I think that was a big shift for me once I finally realized that evaluation could actually help me improve as a specialist and improve the programs. And then that was a, that was a good shift to happen. The two programs that we're going to use is kind of the, the baseline for this or how to, we're going to explain the, the evaluation tools. Um, so Kevin and I can kind of run through these two programs since we've both been part of them. Uh, but Cafe Talks, if, when we talk about those, it's, it's usually an ongoing smaller meeting. And so, um, gosh, Kevin, you'd have, what, 30 to 40 people at those meetings at a time? Or Yeah, it's been interesting. You get anywhere from 25 to 30 to once in a while, you'll get 75 people there. And it's a great opportunity for us to, to engage uh, with, with the county agent or extension agent who, who basically will oftentimes run this program with the help of a, a state specialist or a research specialist that may be tied to a research extension center. And so the opportunity really gives us a chance to engage with not only our, our constituents, but also those other people in, the, in that community that look at ways to enhance what we know or what they know. A lot of times our producers know more than we know, and it allows us to create and share these ideas uh, across with that group of people that we're looking at. Yeah, so then we also, so if we have that kind of style of meeting, right, the informal discussion style, um, getting a lot of information from other people. And then we also have these large annual events, which I think a lot of people can relate to, too. We're all required as specialists to host some kind of large event. Um, and in this case, we're going to refer to the Conservation Tillage Conference or the Dirt Workshop, which is is an event that we have in December. The CTC was, was one that we held for a couple years jointly with the University of Minnesota, and now we have since transitioned to the Dirt Workshop, uh, which was held in person one year and then virtually this past year. So that one typically draws between 200 to 350 people for two consecutive days, a really intensive program where we're sharing a lot of information, and usually people are exhausted by the time they leave that one. Um, but that at least gives you some idea of, of the context we're using these evaluation tools um, for both smaller meetings, but then also these larger ones that, that, uh, that can be really impactful and where we need to measure that impact because we have sponsors and we have a lot of effort put into that, that type of event. Um, so, Gene, what is the first step in evaluating these programs? Um, here it's something called a needs assessment. Yeah, that's the, the, that's the thing that I'm always constantly harping on. That needs assessment is really where everything starts and everything ends, and it's something we keep coming back around to all the time. Um, and I was just looking through some of the responses that people are giving here. And it looks like we've got a nice variety of folks. We've got um, Jane, who's going to be doing a, a webinar for about 50 to 75 people. Um, we've got Angie, who's going to do something for uh, over 500 participants on a virtual field day. OTM Baking School. I'm not sure what OTM is. So Donna, if you could let us know what OTM is. Um, over the something or other um, market. I don't know. Um, but 24 students, we've got a snowshoeing event for 10 participants. That sounds nice and intimate um, and could be a lot easier. Um, so there's a really nice sort of broad um, a spectrum of folks here. And you're all going to have different needs. And so where you're going to want to start is with the what. What do I need to evaluate? There are really five basic questions you have to answer every time for every evaluation. What do I need to evaluate? 
Why do I need to evaluate it? Who does it need to serve? When does it need to be done? And how much money or other resources do I have that I can throw at it? But that what and that why, there's a, there's a slide of those. And that what and that why are really um, the two key ones that play off of each other a lot at the very beginning. Um, at the very beginning, when I first started out, um, I was first known as Survey Girl, which kind of irritated me a little bit because that was only one of my tools. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the other thing I kind of became known as was the So What Girl. Um, when I would be in a room full of people and we'd be talking about what they needed to evaluate it and why they needed to evaluate it, somebody eventually would say, I think it'd be really interesting to know blah, blah, blah. And interesting is okay, but if you have, you know, a limited amount of time and money to spend on something, then you really need to know what you're going to do with that data. So I would always phrase the response as, okay, 75% of the people respond to your survey and they answer X. What are you going to do with that data? And if they didn't have an answer, then we would move on. Then that becomes the trivia box. Now, maybe later down the road, there might be a good reason to collect that data. But right now, if we don't know how we're going to use that data, then right now it's trivia. And so we can't spend our time and money on it. So that why question is always the why. Why do you need to know this? Are you, do you need to know it to improve your program? Do you need to know it because... Your boss said you had to have this piece of data. There's a specific question, and nobody, Abby knows exactly which one it is, that I really, um, really do not like that happens all the time on, on extension surveys. Um, but this, their, their bosses are asking them, they have to do it, and so they throw it in there. Um, this who part right here, please make sure that you're part of that who, right? Now, you're going to have funders. You're going to have bosses, you're going to have other people, you're going to have people maybe who sponsored an event who need to know some information or need to know that they spent their money wisely and they spent it well. And that's okay. You're going to serve their needs, but make sure that you also serve your own needs. If you're doing a program, you're going to want to make sure that you are providing um, information for yourself. How do I improve my program? How do I get better at it next year? How do I know I'm doing a good job? Because um, sometimes, you know, I can answer that question for myself better than maybe somebody outside um, can answer that question because they've only seen just a little bit of what I'm doing. Well, if I gather some data that's going to be helpful um, to show what I'm doing and doing it well, that's going um, to really help a lot. On the who, I get confused. So you're, you're, who are you providing the data to? Not who are you serving, but who are you going to share that information with, Right. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Yes. So that serving word gets confused for me sometimes because I'm serving you. Um, yes, I see what you're saying. So you guys as extension agents, especially in agriculture, you're serving the grower. Um, when you're collecting evaluation, you're serving another master. <laughs> it's where I, the way I was thinking about it. So yeah, who is the data going to serve? Who is the data going to help inform? So thanks for stopping and asking about that, Abby. Yeah, that who question is who needs this data? Who needs to know this type of information? Um, and then that one question is always, you know, that's kind of the one that kills us a lot of times. Um, I'll have people that come up and say, hey, Gene, I've got a survey. And, um, you know, we, we have this thing tomorrow. I've got a survey. Can you review it for me? I'm like, wait, tomorrow? <laughs> So people like to wait to the last minute to do things. But if you can plan ahead, that's even better. If you've got grants and you've written a grant application, you know when things are due. So you can set out that outline and you need to know, do I need to know it tomorrow? Do I need to know it next week? Or do I have a month or do I have a whole year to collect this data? Because that is really going to affect the types of data that you collect, right? You don't necessarily have time to do in-depth interviews with 25 people if it's due next week. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that you need to ask yourself. And then the money question, you know, do I have any money? If I don't necessarily have any money in my budget, though, please, if you're writing an application for a grant and you're doing evaluation, put some money in there. Um, and because if no, for another reason, you're going to need to pay a tech or somebody to help you with it. Um, what are the other resources that you've got that you can, can do? Because this is, you know, evaluation is like any kind of research, really, where, you know, you can build the ocean liner or you could build a raft. Right. So are you going to be looking at something at the microscopic level? <clears throat> are you going to be looking at something at the macroscopic level? And that's about, you know, time and money. How much time and money do I have to spend on this? What kind of resources do I have? You know, so, Gene, I, the beauty of needs assessment for me is it also tells me what is the questions? Or what do we need to actually serve? And so once we look at the needs assessment, now we need to look at 
selecting the right tool to collect this data. And so outside of surveys to help evaluate programs, can you provide some of these tools to apply to evaluating, for example, the cafe talks or the dirt workshops? Can you walk us through this process of available tools to help us with this assessment? There are a lot of different tools out there. And I think folks forget, you know, um, you know, we we learn early on that surveys are a great way to collect data, and they really are, especially now that you know online surveys are really convenient. Um, we don't have to print things out, we don't have to stuff envelopes and stick stamps on them for return. And that was you know, so a survey used to be a great big production, and now we can pop something up in Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey and 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 throw something out, or even a Google form, and those are all great. But there are a lot of other options that are out there. And so depending on what the information is that you're looking for, there are going to be other tools that might be available to you. There might be secondary data. There's data out there that already exists that somebody else is collecting. Um, use their data. It's free. It's out there. Um, so, you know, check and make sure, okay, has somebody else collected this? Maybe, maybe we should do a little bit of research. We do this with every research project we do. We go and see what's written in the literature. Well, we can go and look and see what other people have already done. There's a ton of data out there. Um, you've also got interviews. That's one thing I also mentioned. You can do interviews with people, in-depth interviews, or even just very short, brief interviews with people. Um, you can do that face-to-face -face one day when we can actually meet in person again. Um, or we could do that online. You could do it on Zoom, or you could just do it on a phone call. Um, some people, myself included, just miss the good old phone call <laughs> where you get on the horn and you, and you call somebody up. Um, there's also, um, you could do focus groups. Sometimes it's actually more appropriate to get five or six people, eight people, 10 people together. You don't want to, you don't want 20 people or more, but you know, eight to 10 to 12 people in a room to discuss a topic. Um, on a survey, we don't always know that Bob and Jane mean the same thing when they circle two, right? And so if we want to get a little bit more in depth about what Bob and Jane mean when they circle two, and we want to get a little bit more understanding of why and why they answered the way they did on a specific survey or why they're thinking the way they're thinking, then that might be a focus group question where you can have people sitting in a room. And you've seen this, this especially happens at the cafe talks, right? Where you've got people who are sitting there and that synergy happens and, and you know, somebody will say something and somebody on the other side of the room will respond to that something. Um, and so that kind of thing happens. Um, and so if you've got, you've got those, what else have we got? We've got, oh, network analysis. So this was something that uh, was important to Abby. Um, and when Abby and I did this needs assessment, um, you know, I have these questions down. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, but when we went with, when I was having those conversations with you, Abby, we weren't just going down that list. We were actually having a conversation. What is the program about? What are our desired outcomes? And one of the things that you had tell you told me about the cafe talks is you're trying to build these networks of people who are sharing information, and and even more than that, you were hoping that they were going to start you know talking with each other and problem solving with each other, and maybe sharing equipment, um, and you know just talking shop more more frequently. And so for me, you know, because I've been doing this for a long time, I knew that there's a tool out there called network analysis, and so that was a tool I brought in and, and helped with that. Um, Gosh, am I missing some other things that we've used, Abby, um, over the years with our um, with the cafe talks, the surveys? I think I think one of them, like when you're talking about that synergy that's happening at the cafe, where everybody's talking and they're sharing information, and then and then how do we capture that, or do we collect that? What's happening, right? And that's maybe where the observation comes in. And so we've developed some really intensive observation sheets. So, Gene, if you want to talk about those, that'd be great. Yes, thank you for that reminder. I knew I was missing a really good one. Um, so, observation is something that we do all the time. We walk into a room and we see what's happening. We see who's interacting with whom. We see, you know, how it's set up and maybe it's not set up the right way. We walk in and we go, oh, this isn't right for a meeting. And we start rearranging things. And so when we do this, we're, um, you know, we're, we're making these observations and then we're making judgments and we're moving on it and acting on it right away. So observation and evaluation is just being a little bit more systematic about how you're collecting it. And so, as Abby mentioned, we have sheets that we use where people actually check off boxes. We know specific topics that are going to happen. They check off the boxes um, that are going to that are that people talk about. But we also want to know: Are they engaged? Um, and we can see when people start picking up their phones and they're looking at their phones the whole time, you know, 
or they start texting with other people, or they have start having conversations on the side with other people. These are little signals that that tell us that they're maybe not engaged in what's happen actually happening um, at the front of the room. Uh, and so these are things you can collect these these data a little bit more systematically. You can do this in field days just as well, right? You can see when you walk from field to field. Um, you can see little groups happening and people starting to discuss things. And if you're kind of walking amongst them, you can hear if they're talking about, you know, what their kids did in school that day, or if what they're talking about is what just happened in that field that they were just in and starting to share that information. So these are things that we can do. And it's observation is free. If you've got somebody there, one thing though, too, is that if you're the only one running the meeting, then observation is going to be not a great option for you. You want somebody else who's not running the meeting to be able to be looking at what's happening around the room and recording data. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's hard enough to run a meeting, <laughs> let alone take all the data and collect and all the information. <laughs> <laughs> Gene, so there was a great question on the chat. And one of them, when you do surveys, they ask, when doing a survey, what percent response should you expect um, to be a good survey? The eternal question, right? So right. I will share that when I first started um, doing this in agriculture, uh, 20 years ago now, on my own, I could promise my clients 75% um, or more response rate. Uh, things have changed significantly. And I'm not able to, to actually promise that anymore because people are surveyed to death. Okay. Every time we turn around, there's another survey in our inbox or in our mail or, you know, at the counter when we're waiting for our food or at the hotel or, you know, everywhere we go, there are now surveys. And so survey fatigue is real, just like Zoom, you know, Zoom fatigue is real. Survey fatigue is real. And so you have to maybe account for that. Um, it's funny, you know, sometimes I'll see industry surveys by, you know, big corporations, DuPont or some of these other guys, and they'll survey and they'll have like a 1% response rate. And for me, I just think, wow, you cannot start generalizing that data. We all know that. That's, that's just not acceptable. But for you and what you're doing, one of the things that I am usually able to do on a, on a grower survey, um, and this hasn't been true in, in um, major crops, is I've worked mostly, up until I met Abby, I worked mostly in specialty crops, so, you know, fruits and vegetables. And so I could almost always get at least 50% of the acreage of whatever that crop was. Now, in major crops, that's going to be completely different again. Uh, if you have an event that you're evaluating, I think that you should shoot for at least 50% of a response rate. Um, I know we all want to get that 90% and we feel like, why aren't they answering this? I worked so hard. Um, but we all know we're all really busy. Um, and so we just see those things and sometimes they're just not at the top of our priority list. Uh, one thing that's worked well for Abby is because she's, you know, created relationships with a lot of the people that she works with and a lot of the the growers who attend her meetings, um, she can make that personal plea. And so when you can make that personal plea, people want to do things for you. You know, they want to, they want you to succeed as well. And if you let them know that this is really important to you, not just because your boss told you you had to do it, but because it's information that you're then going to use, people are going to want to do that for you. And then there's also the, you know, the karmic bank of response rates. Okay. So if you're sending out surveys, you need to start actually answering some of those too. Okay. There's a whole karma thing there. Yeah. yeah I answer true. everyone I get from Verizon or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they say, do you want to take the survey? I take it. <laughs> Cause yeah. I, Cause you got to do it. I'm not saying you have to do every one, but yeah, you got to, you got to, you just got to, because you know, someday that's going to be you asking somebody else to fill out that survey. Right. I'm going to need to change my uh, format and start answering some of these surveys. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> so. So I think, you know, like Jean, Jean said, I've made that personal plea multiple times to, to the farmers or whoever's answering our evaluation, our surveys. And, um, and, and I think it's and I think telling people how that information is going to be used to benefit them is, is the angle I take. So I, I let them know that, that we're not just collecting this because, because my bosses want it or because I need to write an impact right. report or I need to do something like that. I am collecting this because I genuinely want to make these programs better. And we've used a lot of that information to make the programs better. For, for example, on something like the, the Conservation Tillage Conference, when we, when we surveyed that one, we found out from the, from the survey that 
that people didn't feel like they had enough time between the sessions. So we were trying to cram way too much information in, in too tight a time period. And we were giving them, I think, five minutes between sessions. And people really didn't like that because they felt like they were being you know, pushed from one thing to the next. So the next year, we had 15 minutes between sessions. We gave people time to wrap up. We made sure that that 45-minute time slot that people were attending a session, that really only 30 minutes of it was content, 15 minutes for Q&A, and truly for Q&A, not just the fake Q&A like if you run over, <laughs> uh, but truly Q&A, and then 15 minutes between sessions to get to where you're going. And and after that, it was like you could just sense the whole room was just way more relaxed. People enjoyed it more. They didn't feel like they were getting so much information crammed down their throats. Uh, they had time for those hallway conversations that we know are important. And, and so as soon as I tell them that that's how the, the information is used, then all of a sudden it clicks and it makes sense as to why we're doing this and pestering people for information. True. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, addresses one of the um, – there was a, a question in the chat about – you know, how do, how do you make the surveys seem more urgent for a reply? How do we motivate people to actually reply to a survey that we've sent them? And it's just what Abby said, you let them know that you're using this data. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the messages that I often have, you know, at the beginning when I'm sending out the invitation, you know, I say something about, you know, we want to improve. And so we actually are going to use this, but also we want to keep getting money for research. And we can't do that if we don't have data. So you all know if you've gone for any of the grants, you know, Abby, I think it's helped you and I'm probably Kevin too as well. You know, you guys are submitting grants all the time. And when you've actually got data that says, you know, this, that, or the other thing, because you've collected it during your previous events um, and programming, your likelihood of getting funding actually increases. Has that been your experience? I mean, you're absolutely right, Gene. You know, if we can get an output from what we, what we delivered that can tell a story and provide real meaning to help us do future projects, it definitely, the surveys definitely have value. And, and it's not just for administration who needs it. It's really for us to help us go to the next phase and to help our producers to, to be better at what they're doing so they become more economically viable as well. So you're correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so once you grab that, grab that data, it's useful on all these different levels, right? So it's useful for me because I'm going to get more funding. It's useful for me because I'm going to improve my programming and improve my message and, and improve how it is or, or know what that next step is that we need to take, you know, with, with whatever the programming is. Um, but it's also useful for, for the funder because they get to know that they're, um, they're actually spending their money wisely uh, and that they're getting a return on investment, um, which isn't money, but it's actual, you know, outputs and outcomes and, and there's definite impact happening. And our bosses know we're doing a good job. Um, so all those, all those, those things come into play. So Jean, there's, there's a question about <clears throat> how do you translate the observational data into report writing? Uh, and so that's, if you're gonna choose that as your tool, how do you convey that information uh, in a report to show impact? So you would convey that information uh, the same as you would any other information. You can say that we collected observation data and the results are, you know, X. And so treat it as data because it is data and you did collect it systematically. This is not anecdotal data, okay? Anecdotal data is the stuff that, you know, people just hear on the street or they heard from somebody or their Aunt Susie said, blah, 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 right? That's anecdotal. Um, and anecdotal data can be very appropriate in some settings, <clears throat> but when you're talking about um, presenting evaluation data, observation is a valid tool. As long as you've got a form that tells you, this is what I'm observing, and these are the, these are the data that I've collected. Um, one of the things, uh, for example, Abby, when we were doing the, um, well, I think one of the first cafe talks, uh, the observation data included what topics were covered, um, during all of the, each, each and every one of the cafe talks, what topics were covered. And then the data that we collected in a survey um, included what practices people are adopting. Um, what, you know, what are they, uh, what are they likely to adopt? Have they adopted it because they've been to this? Are they, you know, thinking about it or definitely not thinking about it? Cause that gives us data too. Um, and when we put together that data, we could see in our observation data that at 100% of the meetings, we covered cover crops. And cover crops were one of the biggest um, adoption practices that, that, were being, that, were, that was happening, was, that was being impacted, right? We had more people in that area. Am I remember that data correctly, Abby? 
Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that, that it was, um, that we talked about 100% of the time, and then we had really high adoption rates for cover crops. Now, we also talked about reducing tillage 100% of the time, but we didn't see those adoption rates for, for reducing tillage, specifically in strip till. And then we connected mm -hmm. that with some other data we had collected that said that cost of equipment is a major barrier. And so now we can see that it's not necessarily, you know, that, that people are, aren't seeing it in their area, so they're not adopting it. It was really that, that reducing tillage in the form of strip till was not being adopted because of cost of equipment, which, which then we can say, okay, well, maybe we don't need to cover that as much because that's a really specific group of people that's going to adopt that practice. Right. And, and it was also that it wasn't our messaging, right? It's not our messaging and how we're delivering this information. That's not the reason they're not adopting it. Um, we're teaching it just fine. We're communicating this, this, you know, the importance of it just fine. It's that they can't afford the equipment. So it's just not going to happen. Um, so these are some of the ways that you can use observation data. You can also, um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, to um, uh, convey how, how engaged people were, one of the things that we have on our observation data for the cafe talks is um, tick marks for how many people actually speak, you know, how many people have participated during each of these conversations. And you can see, you know, engagement and you can report that engagement. Um, you know, 90% of the people were actually engaged in a very specific way. They actually spoke or responded to a question or asked a question. Um, you know, engagement's a big thing that people talk about on social media, but it's important in our meetings too. We don't want to have, you know, the talking heads at the front. I mean, there's a time for that. There's a time for a lecture. Um, but Cafe Talks was not that time for a lecture. It's, it's about engaging and get every, getting everybody, you know, um, into the conversation. Did that answer the question? What was the question again? Oh, about how to uh, report observation data. You can report, there are people who, there's a, you know, there's a, a conversation happening in the evaluation world about the appropriateness of using um, numbers and percentages for uh, narrative data, for qualitative data. And there are those who think that it's not really appropriate to say, you know, 60, <clears throat> 65% of the, the people used this word or said X. Um, it's more appropriate to say, you know, the majority of the people said. Um, that debate's still kind of going on. I tend to, if it's 100% of the people said this, then I'm fine using that percentage. Um, and there are certain areas where I'll use percentage, but otherwise I'll say, you know, the majority, the vast majority of the people said, you know, yada, yada, or they responded in this way um, to this topic. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, you can Google, there's a lot of qu qualitative, how do you present qualitative data? Um, but some of the data that we're collecting through observation is quantitative. How many people actually participated? Those are tick marks. Those are, those are actual numbers. Gene, can you describe network analysis more in depth? Because it definitely will help me if you, if you describe it well. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> let's see if I'm up to the task. Um, all right. So network analysis, uh, I'm not going to give you the whole background of it, but you've all seen the maps that can look like big old hairballs of lines connecting everybody. Um, it was a big thing going around in Facebook for a while, um, several years ago, where you could, one of those little plug-in apps where you could say, you know, map my friendships, and they would pop up a map, and it would say how all your friends are connected, right? So that's a map of all these connections, and that's basically what we're talking about as a network. Um, networks are used a lot by the CDC, which more and more people are now aware of uh, because of covid um, where they're talking about where does it start and then how does that follow through? This is something in infectious diseases they've been using for years, um, for decades, they've been using network analysis because they want to know how something's going to travel if it's an infectious disease. Well, we want that same thing to happen with our, our information, right? We want our information to go viral. We want our information to be an infectious disease that catches as many people as we can, right? So how do we map how that's happening? And so for the cafe talks, we did that in two ways. One way was um, just by virtue of having attended a meeting, you're part of that network. So everybody at the table is connected to everybody at, at a specific meeting. And now if we have several meetings, you know, we're going to have those clusters, but are there some that actually connect those various meetings? And is it more than just Abby because she's at all of them? Right. So is it other growers or other agents or other consultants who are there? Because you can look at that map then and you can see who some of these key people are, where if they were to be taken out of the network, then, it, you know, 
we've got this group of people here that's going to be left out of the loop, right? So that's one of the things you can do. The other thing that we did um, for network analysis for the cafe talks was we asked them specifically on a survey, who are the three, up to three people, three growers, who are three growers that you talk shop with about, specifically about soil health over the last you know, year? Who are the three people you talk to most about soil health? Um, and then we asked them also, who are the three non-growers you talk to about soil health over the past year? So you want to be very specific about a topic, not just, you know, were you just at the bar drinking beers with the guy? Um, if you were at the bar drinking beers and talking soil health, then, you know, that qualifies. So with this information, I could start connecting, you know, who people are talking to and what that network looks like, right? So each spot is a person and then the lines are drawn to other people that they've either named or who have named them, right? So it can go both ways. One of the things that we learned uh, in this past round, I think it was the 2019 survey, Abby, was um, when we looked at the data, we had map, we had a map of all the growers and all the consultants and all the people who were named that they talked to. And sometimes it was bankers and sometimes it was consultants and sometimes it was NDSU folk. Um, and so we had that big map, all the spots were people, all the lines were people that they talked to. And if we took out all of NDSU, then that decreased the density of that graph. I can't remember. It was like, I want to say it was at least threefold. When you added the NDSU folks back in, it was at least threefold, three times the number of opportunities to communicate information. So this is a really good, helpful way to see that, you know, we are actually serving a purpose in this community by getting this information out because it's not, we asked them to say that it's not, we mapped, we were at a meeting. We asked the growers, who do they talk to about soil health or about grazing or about cover crops or about, you know, whatever your particular topic is. And then we can actually see that data. I don't know if that clarified or not, um, if that muddied it a little bit. Well, it definitely helps me, and I and I remember that graph, and it, it does show a, a a telling story of the value of NDSU and the role that we play in in basically helping create this soil health uh, community and, and education that goes with it. So I think it was a great way to explain it. I, I think I get it a little bit better now, at least. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There. I mean, there's other things too. There's lots of things. You know, you could you could look at the density of a map. One of the things that we do at our at any time Abby has a meeting because she's very heavy on Twitter, right? I can I, I have a program that I do my network analysis on where I can actually download the tweets um, if you use the specific hashtag, and and so we look at the conversation on day one, and it might look like you know maybe a handful of people. And then I, you know, each day I'll download the data and you see it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of the things this tells us is that that information is not just staying in the room. And this has always been, a, you know, a concern or, you know, an interest at the very least of programming is you don't want it to stay in that room. You want that information to get shared. And you can see then that we've got this whole network of people who were not at the meeting. I can, you know, re bring that data down and I can look at, you know, who was at the meeting and who wasn't at the meeting. And you can see that reach really growing. We all hope that they tell two people who tell two people who tell two people. Um, so that's something that you want to look at as well. Do you have any recommendations for evaluating long-term behavior change among producers? So three years or more, um, I think we have some idea, you know, like with the cafe talks, for example, we don't evaluate that program every single year because we know those changes are, are probably not happening that quickly. We need people to think about what they've learned. We need to, they need you know, time to put it in action. And so we do that program evaluation every three years, um, also in hopes to not over survey people. <laughs> so, um, so you know, is there, do you have other recommendations for kind of a time span? I mean, we chose three years, but is there something else that, that would change that number or that time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the first thing you want to do is collect a baseline. And if it's not at the very beginning of a program, that's fine. You know, you start where you're where you are, um, collect that baseline data. And I'm going to say go back to your needs assessment. What is it that you need to evaluate over time? What do you want to know over time? If it's practice adoption, then you document a baseline for, you know, in 2021, 
this many growers are doing this, or this many homeowners are doing this, these practices that we're concerned about, make it about your programming, you know, and that can grow and change and you can add practices and take them away as you go. But, you know, start with what is it that we're actually working on? Are we working on, you know, cover crops or tillage or, you know, actually testing their soil? Are they doing a shovel test even, you know? So what are the practices? Figure out what it is exactly that you want. Get that baseline on what they're doing and then measure that. You know, if you have a five-year grant, it'd be great to get a midterm, you know, like maybe not the very next year because your baseline Maybe it's a new practice and nobody's doing it and you know, nobody's doing it. And so you can still get that baseline though. Cause then you have that solid number that says nobody's doing this, or, you know, we can assume zero because it wasn't invented yet. Come in two years and then come in again, five years and ask that same question. You have to be careful if you're doing it on a survey to ask the question in the exact same way that you asked it the first time, because if you don't, if you change that wording then that comparison can get a little fudgy, right? And it could be, it could become apples and oranges, or it could be, you know, um, tangerines versus navel oranges. So they're oranges, but they're not really the same variety. So, you know, your data gets a little bit fuzzy there. Um, there was at some point, uh, a few years ago, I haven't looked at it recently, but several years ago, there was a study done in that, that said, you know, in agriculture, it's, you know, eight to 10 years is generally the time frame for, adopting a new practice that was a, you know, that was kind of a, a big deal. That wasn't a, you know, just a throwaway practice. It was a, a big deal. Um, and I, you know, I think that that time frame might've gotten shorter, but as we know, most grants at that point, and even still, you know, three to five year grants, sometimes now they're just yearly grants, but you know, you can usually get a three to five year grant if you're working on something big. Um, and so, you know, that by year five, you're not going to be able to say, you know, this percentage of growers adopted, you know, the, the percentage that we really want happening by year five, which you can document though. And something that I do recommend that you do and you build into your evaluation is um, our questions that help you answer the likelihood that they'll adopt the program, the practice. So things that we've built into our surveys are um, opinions about a specific type of practice um, and also barriers questions. So if you ask questions at the beginning, like what are the barriers to adoption? And you've got things like lack of knowledge or, you know, cost of equipment or, you know, landlords, or, you know, you build your, your list based on what you think those barriers are. You give them that option to say other and fill that in because there are often things that we just don't even think about. And you've got those numbers at the beginning. And if those numbers start to shift, you know, cost of equipment isn't going to, you know, that probably isn't going to go down much, but it might. Um, but other things like lack of information or confidence in the practice, or, you know, we don't know that it's going to work in this area. You know, we want to see if there's a shift in that. And if there's a shift in that number from year five to year, from year one to year five, then we can say there's an, you know, there's a high likelihood. We've increased the likelihood that they will adopt this practice. Yeah, all great information. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Evaluation is my life. <laughs> it is, and, and there's a lot to take in. And so maybe let's go through a couple slides that you have, Jean, on tool mm -hmm. selection. And maybe if we go through this, it'll solidify some of these concepts for, for people. Um, so on this one, we have, you know, what do you need to know? And then what's the best way to know this? Okay, yeah. so we, we've kind of lined this up, Jean, right, with, with things from the cafe talk, right? So mm -hmm. from that program, we needed to know what practices are being adopted or considered. Okay, mm -hmm. so do we want to have people in the chat to kind of throw some ideas in there on what that might be, or we've got them up already now? <laughs> well, we've got some up already, and I think that, you know, but it would be good to see if anybody else comes with any other ideas. I mean, obviously, we can ask the growers, right? Um, but I'm going to bet that most of you haven't thought of just doing observation on this. You can actually go and see, you know, if somebody's farm is blowing away, they're, they're not doing no-till. Um, you know, there might be other things you'll see, um, new structures built or new things that are happening and you'll be able to actually obs observe that on their farms. Um, sure. Kevin, do you get a lot of, you know, just driving around? I mean, you can see some of the new practices or grazing management approaches that you're recommending. Yeah. I mean, if you get out in the state, you know, you can see what's been imp implemented or not implemented. And, you know, there's a number of practices that we talk about and 
we may not see it. And you wonder why. Why are not they not implementing it? And that's another question that I think, okay, here's opportunities. Why aren't they implementing them? And I, I don't know why. It's a great question to ask. You can observe it mm -hmm. or observe not observe it, but why? And that, well, that why, for me, that would bring it right back to a focus group. That'd be a great opportunity to have focus groups to follow up on that why question. You get a group of guys together who aren't doing it and they'll be, you know, usually happy to tell you all the things that are wrong, right? People are always healthy, happy to tell us what we're doing wrong. <laughs> um, and so if you get them together and that follow up of, you know, I've observed this happening or not happening. And if you want to get into that deeper understanding, then, then yeah, focus groups are great. Or even one-on-one -on -one conversations. If you're going to visit their, their, their farms, you know, come up with your list of questions and make sure that you ask those exact same questions to each of the growers. And those are going to lead to other topics and conversations. But if you start with the same header, then you've collected data um, systematically. Um, you can also go collect on-farm data, you know, for, for Abby's practices, you know, you can go and do some soil tests and see has their soil health changed, you know, what's going on in the soil horizon or, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, secondary data. There are lots of tools out there and we're going to give you some, some resources at the very end. There's a couple of websites that, that go that have actual tools that you can use and surveys that you can use. There's also, you know, secondary data. There's other people collecting things. Abby, you were talking about... Um, we, were, we were getting some questions about our cover crops being adopted by, by pulse crop growers or by, um, sorry, edible bean growers. And there's this great report that Greg Endress at Carrington REC is part of. And, he, and he, there's a report that comes out that says X number of acres were reported by growers as they used a cover crop. And, and so, you, you know, that was something that I, I didn't know it existed until Greg sent it to me and said, this exists. <laughs> and so, uh, but it was great information because then I could then incorporate that into our practices, you know, on things that were, were of interest. Uh, so the practices that we're demonstrating or the, the grants that we're writing for the practices we'd like to adopt to that commodity group. Um, so yeah, doing a little searching, contacting your colleagues, finding out, I mean, all of us are rep writing reports all the time and including this information. And it may just not occur to us that that might be important to somebody else. Um, so I think that that's, it, it's a really good idea to tap into your colleagues and see what they have um, in, their, in their stash of, of data. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I see that Mark, oh, is it Mark or somebody who just said that something about there's a lot of, of barriers out there and could you assemble a cafe talk just on this to talk because they don't know what their options are. And absolutely. That, that whole cafe talk could be that. And that basically serves as a focus group, right? You get that information and then you've got somebody who's recording exactly what all their barriers are that they're saying and how you're sharing. And that you can say this is our first contact for saying, you know, this X, Y, or Z happened. Um, so one of the, the next things we've got is, um, uh, what do you need to know? I need to know if people are sharing the information. Is it going outside of the meeting room or out off the farm that we did the, the, um, the field day on? Sharing beyond the rumor meeting, that's, that's easy with, with Twitter that we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. You know, setting up a hashtag for a meeting. So, for example, the hashtag that I forgot to mention for this meeting <laughs> at the start of it is <laughs> hashtag com workshop ND. And so if you're on Twitter, this would be a great way we could actually do a network from this meeting. If people, if you pull up your Twitter accounts, put something on there with the hashtag com workshop ND, and then we could track that. And maybe next week we could show you one of those maps. Yeah. And uh, that's actually quite easy to do. And I can even show you how easy it is to do it, um, to create that. There was a question earlier that talked about an mm -hmm. analyzing these social media types of outputs. And so this, this would be a great way to show, you know, what you can achieve from the social media and then how to analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll try and take some screenshots because I'm not able to actually share my screen in this format, but I'll take some screenshots of the software that I use um, so that you can see exactly, you know, it's a drop down menu and it's in a, it's an Excel add in. It's a drop down menu that says, you know, pull in from Facebook, pull in from Twitter, pull in from, I can't remember what the other one, there's just, they don't have all of them. They don't have all the, all the things, but they have some of the major ones and it says, you know, pull it in and it pulls that data in and it's complete. It tells me who it is, what time they, they tweeted it. It gives me the content of the tweet, tells me what time zone they were in. Um, it tells me, it gives me their, you know, the description of who they are, um, which is that public thing that we put in our Twitter thing. So uh, always keep in mind that when you're using Twitter, all that, all that's public. <laughs> so don't tweet anything you don't want your mom to know. Um, so it's, it's, it's going out there. 
Um, and so I can actually, um, you know, pull that data in and then, you know, I can map that map, but I can also look at that content and look at, you know, I have the data, I have all of the words that everybody used in their short tweets and I can do a content analysis on what was it they were talking about within the NDSU, uh, the, the com workshop ND hashtag. All right, because there's going to be there are several of these happening every week. And, you know, maybe this one is going to be about evaluation. But the ones two weeks ago, probably evaluation wasn't going to be one of the things in that content. And so we can actually pull down content and associate them with different, you know, different components. You can like any data set, you can mine things for, you know, decades if you wanted to. But just make sure you get that key, that key question. Well, Answer, wasn't there yeah. a trick you taught me, Jean, with um, that you could actually, if, you, if on Twitter, if you put in your hashtag, like I put in com workshop ND, and then mm -hmm. I'd also tag node XL mm -hmm. in there that sometimes they pick that up and then they do the map for you. They do. <laughs> so they, so they that's do. a really nice way to, so node XL, N-O-D-E, XL, X, right? Letters and XL, yeah. XL. And I don't know if you, I forget if it's an ad that you put before it or a hashtag before, but somehow they pick it up and they will map mm -hmm. it for you. Both of them, you know, either one of them works. I think they have a bot that tells them it that tells somebody them that um, tagged um, them. Tag them. And, and uh, uh, yeah, the very, yeah, first, the very time, first time, you know, we did you that. Know, we did I, that. I, I downloaded it and I had, you know, tagged the software, pardon me, the software that I'd used. And this is something I think for any software that you use, if you're using a very specific piece of software and you tag that software company um, or that organization or whatever, your reach is going to increase exponentially, right? Because they're going to grab that and they're going to let people know that they're talking, to, that there's somebody talking about us. Here it is. Well, these guys at Node Excel, they grabbed it. They grabbed a couple of pieces of detail that, that were in some of the content and they cranked out other maps that were just, of course, beautiful and brilliant because they literally wrote the software, um, and so they were able to, to do that. But yeah, Node Excel is the software that I use. There's a couple of different pieces of software but um, that you can use for, for network analysis. But um, since we're all familiar with Excel, it's probably the easiest if you're not going to do super, you know, um, complex, if you're not going to get really into, you know, the deep depths of, of network analysis, um, it's going to be the easiest to learn uh, because we're familiar in that environment. Yeah, oh, man, we have less than 10 minutes left. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> the good thing is that we can, can we can go a little bit beyond 1030 if we need to. If this is helpful to everybody, we can certainly go a little bit beyond. Yeah. Um, do we want to finish out this tool selection with the, the barriers to adoption and the best way to know this? And then maybe we'll just put up the usefulness of, of program for the participant. We could just sure. put both of those up. Um, so barriers to adoption, again, asking the growers, um, you can use a survey, you can use a focus group, you can use interviews. These are going to be some of our tools, but think outside the survey box, right? We can do other things. Usefulness of program for a participant. Again, we've got surveys and observations because we can see their engagement. If nobody is really engaged, if we've got a room full of people on their phones, we know they're not engaged. So it's not useful to them. That's an indicator. What's an indicator that we know somebody is doing this? So you can do interviews. You can also look at repeat customers. This is something that we looked at for the CTC um, workshops that have been going on for years. Um, and we'd ask them, you know, how many had they been to? And, and you want a balance. You don't want everybody to be new. You want that balance of repeat customers. Repeat customers are telling you that what you've got is good and they want to come back and, and, you know, and take some more of it. Um, and so it's nice to have maybe a 50, 50, cause you want to keep getting new people too. You want to bring more people in, but even if you get 30 new, 30% new people, um, this is, you know, something that you can do. So is there a way to measure or categorize changes in actions or behavior as a means of evaluating usefulness? So, um, I, I think that if you're going to, you know, measure change over time, then you're probably going to want to do a survey. Um, but you can also do that with your observations, you know, like Abby was talking about the CTC, the big, you know, that big meeting, and she could observe, you know, that next year, how much more relaxed things were, you know, five minutes between sessions is not enough to do that dash. It's enough to get there. You get, yeah, you can get there, but this isn't high school. We don't need to get to the next period to start our class. Right. We can have conversations in the hallway. Um, Cause those are actually encouraged. And so you can use that. You can use that observation as well. Um, 
the last two things that um, I like to share whenever you're doing, especially with surveys, um, ask good questions. There is uh, a right way and a wrong way to ask a question, okay? Um, and there are better ways and worse ways. Um, sometimes it is right or wrong in some cases, but in some cases it's better or worse. Um, and people think that anybody can write a survey, but that just isn't the case because all too often, we see this in all the polls for the political polls. They're always, you know, very leaning about, you know, they can, they're telling you what way they want you to answer the question, right? So um, here's, a, here's a question for you guys. You've got a scale uh, that goes from extremely difficult to extremely easy. And here are two options. How hard was it to incorporate uh, cover crops into your system? And B, what was your experience with incorporating cover crops into your system? Which would you say is the better way to ask this question on a survey? A, when we ask how hard was it to incorporate cover crops, we are telling them that it was hard to, to, to incorporate cover crops, right? We're making that assumption for them, right? And so we're already telling them, we're already jading that question. But if we say, what was your experience? They can say, oh, it was actually, it wasn't really that bad. It was pretty easy. Um, so we give them more of an option, whereas that's a very leading question. Um, and then on the next slide, this is actually something that I got recently. I got this question recently in my email because somebody wanted me to evaluate their customer service. And it says, hi, Jean, you recently contacted our support team and worked with Joshua C regarding email limits and code showing up in your account. Did you get the assistant that you needed? Yes or no? There are actually two points that should be answered. So when I got this question, when I got this email from these guys, the question about um, code showing up in my account had been answered and solved, but there was still, email limits was still a problem for me. So how am I supposed to answer that question, right? I can't, I can't answer that question. I can't, I mean, I could say yes or no, but you know, I, I emailed Joshua, the guy who was actually helping me, who was super helpful. And I said, hey, I'm not answering this question because I think that's going to come back to you on your <laughs> performance review. If I answer this no, but I want you to know so that you have actual documented evidence that says you were great and you helped me with this problem. The other department over there that's working on email limits is still not done. Um, so yeah, this is that thing. And these are called double barreled questions. And um, it's easy to do it. But if you see that word and or, or in your question, it's a red flag. It doesn't mean it can't be there. It just means, hey, stop and take another look at this question. Is this a double barreled question? Um, I've seen questions with, you know, six ands in them. And it's just is, it just is like, really, how am I supposed to answer this? Um, this is the University of Wisconsin has an awesome evaluation program, fyi.extension.wisc.edu. If you were to just Google University of Wisconsin Extension Evaluation, you're going to get to this page. And you can see they have planning programs, designing programs, evaluating programs. And the evaluating programs, they've got a whole slew and ton of resources, um, pardon me, and tools and useful tips and, and handouts and, and things. And then the next page is the Western IPM Center. If Even if you're not doing IP, IPM as integrated pest management, for those of you who don't work in ag, um, the, the, even if that's not what your area is, they actually have gone through all a bunch of like surveys, network analysis, focus groups, secondary data, case studies, interviews. They've gone through each of these and, and outlined when is this appropriate and then some tips on how to do it um, and then some resources for how to do it well. So this is actually, even if you're not in agriculture, it's a great resource um, to go to, to, to find out a little bit more about each of these methods, methods that you can use for evaluation. <laughs>